We're going to start a brand new series next week that we're super excited about, but I've got a special treat for you today, and it's one of our overseers. We, we have overseers that personally oversee not the day-to-day -day operations, but they oversee Kristen and I. They make sure that our hearts are, are, are still leaned in. They make sure that our marriage is, we still like each other at the end of the day, you know, and and, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not scared to tell you that because that brings health to our church and our family. And, and, and we're not trying to do this as some, some people, you know, set apart. Hey, we're all set apart. We have a specific role, and you do too. And so they bring strength to us. They bring relationship to us. They bring friendship to us. They bring prayer covering to us, which ultimately brings everything to you. And so today we have a special treat. They flew in all the way from Texas, everybody. Come on. Everything's bigger in Texas. It's on today. And uh, I am super, super privileged and honored to be able to present to you uh, Pastors Brian and Crystal Spark. Pastor Brian is going to be bringing the word today to us. I want you to interact with it. I want you to get your faith ready. I'm going to be on the front row taking notes. I want you to join me in it. But before we do that, I want you to stand to your feet as a sign of honor and do it for me. Put your hands together for Pastor Brian Spark. Hey. I think we're on. Holy Moses. Y'all doing good today? Palm City Church. What a cool name. Cool pastors. Cool church. Cool worship. Cool everything. It's good to be in the house uh, today. Uh, I'm excited to be with you. Uh, it is an honor. Uh, for me to be here with you. Uh, Y'all are uh, just finished eight months of, of being a church. We just finished eight years. Come on, we're just a little bit, uh, uh, just a little bit ahead of you, and God is good. And I'm telling you that, that you're in the room of something special. And, uh, you know, the Bible says don't despise the day of small beginnings. And, uh, and I'm just telling you, like, like you're going to need more room. You're going to need more services. You're going to need bigger buildings. Like, because when you have a passion for what God is doing uh, and, and you have uh, amazing people carrying that passion, uh, you just, just you, the building can't be big enough. And so uh, I, I think God's going to do some great things, and I'm excited to just be a part. And so uh, I, I have my lovely wife on the front row with me, and uh, she gets, she, we don't always get to travel together, uh, together, but we are this uh, week. I asked her, I was like, hey, would you just come with me? And so we flew in yesterday, had some good uh, seafood, and then we're flying out a little bit later. So I actually do have a, a picture, an old picture of my family. My wife asked me this morning if I did this. And so here's my family. Uh, my son is now 16, six foot two. Uh, but I don't even think of pictures. My, my daughter is 17, out of braces, uh, but this is the only picture that I had on my phone. So, uh, I don't, you know, I don't Instagram because I don't even think about, I don't think about taking pictures of my food because I eat my food. So, uh, anyway, so... Uh, there, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have to remember to take pictures or else I, I, I just, I miss things. I, I like being in the moment. And so uh, my, my church, One Church, welcome, uh, sends their love and just thank you so much for uh, having us today. I'm excited about preaching God's word. I've got 35 minutes, so I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. But we're going to say what they can't be done. Amen. And uh, I do have a saying at our church, a quiet church is a dead church. And we're not a dead church, amen? The Word of God deserves response, in my opinion. Uh, so you can say amen, you can say that's good, you can say preach, white boy. Uh, you can say whatever you want, just don't cuss at me, it hurts my feelings, okay? So, uh, come on, can we give it up for your pastors? Yeah, come on, give it up for your pastors. That's good. That's good. That's good. You know, I think anybody that would leave a secure job, the place that they know, to move to a city to plant a church is deserving of honor. 
And so never forget that uh, October is Pastor's Appreciation Month, if you don't know that. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. Look it up. Uh, and, you know, the way, the way pastors feel appreciated is uh, large checks, <laughs> Holy Ghost handshakes, just $100 bills in their hands. So love on your pastors this month uh, because they're, they're, they're deserving of it. Amen? All right. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Uh, I, I uh, feel like I got a word for you today, and so I hope you lean into this. Uh, the Bible says this, you are the salt of the earth. Somebody say salt. But if the salt loses its saltiness, come on, tell somebody next to you, say, stay salty. How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. That does not sound good. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. Now, I love this so much because I love this passage of Scripture, but I've never noticed this until recently. Notice the Bible says that it puts it on its stand, meaning this, that you have a stand. You have a platform. God has put you in a place of influence somewhere in your life. It may be in your workplace. Uh, it may be in your neighborhood. It may be in your home. It's in your local grocery store at your favorite restaurant. But I'm telling you that God has put you on a stand. And the goal for that you being on that stand is for you to be a light in the darkness. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, listen, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If you're taking notes today, you can title today's message, Too Good Not to Share. Too Good Not to Share. Notice the Bible tells us to be salt and light. Salt makes things better. Light makes things brighter. Amen. Lord, right now we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's sharper than you two edged sword. We thank you that every ear in here is open and receptive to hear your word. They didn't come to hear a word from a bald, beautiful man. They've come to hear a word from you. So, Lord, use me to speak to the hearts and the lives of your people. Let every life be changed. Let no one lead the same. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You know, uh, uh, several years ago, my wife and I had the amazing opportunity to, to go to Hawaii on vacation. Uh, if you've never been to Hawaii, I highly recommend it. It is beautiful. I know Tampa is beautiful, but man, Hawaii is special, right? Like the, there's a lot of things in this world that are overrated. Hawaii is not one of them. And uh, we were there, and everything is very expensive in Hawaii. And so we found a grocery, uh, like a convenience store on the side of the road that sold sushi. And I'll just tell you this, that, that even Hawaii's Convenience store sushi is better than our just everyday sushi, right? Like everything's really fresh and delicious and amazing. And so we, we stopped in, and, and it, it had me with two things. It was awesome, and it was cheap. And so I was like all in, right? So I'm sitting, we're checking out, we're getting a bunch of different, different things, different sushi rolls and everything, and I look over to the right-hand side, and I see a bag of, it looks like a bag of chips, but instead of like Lay's potato chips, it says shrimp chips. And I was like, what in the world is shrimp chips, right? Like, I'm from Texas, y'all. We don't have shrimp chips in Texas. And so I look over, and I ask the lady, the nice Hawaiian lady uh, that's checking me out, I, I, I said, uh, excuse me, ma'am, what are shrimp chips? And she looks at me in shock and disbelief and says this, and I quote, bra. <laughs> You've never had shrimp, sh sh uh, shrimp chips, bra? And I was like... Never. Like, I've never had these. Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, like I, I don't even know what this is. Like, I don't, I've never tasted it. And she goes on, like, you've got to have these chips. Like, they are incredible. They are the best thing that you will, like, she just talks these up so much that I finally, I was like, fine, ma'am, I bought two bags. Like, we're taking these home. Like, we're going we're gonna to enjoy these. And, and I'll just say this. They're good with sushi, right? Like, they're, they're delicious. And, and, I, and I take these home. But I got to thinking about this, that, that we've all probably experienced something like that. We've all experienced something that, that has changed our life for the better. 
right? Like we eat at a restaurant and we can't wait to tell our friends about like, have you ever eaten at this restaurant? Like you've got to try this place. And when you hear that they have not tried it, you're like, you've got to try it. Like you've got to go here. You've got to try this place. Or, or you're, you're sitting there and you find a product that helps you uh, in, in your life. And you're like, man, have you ever had this product? And you share that with your friends. You tell everybody about that. Or you find a TikTok recipe that actually tastes good. Some of you old people are like, what's TikTok? I only know because my, my, I have teenagers, okay? But, but TikTok recipe that makes everything, like, and it turns out exactly like you thought it was supposed to turn out. It's beautiful. It does not look like a mess. And you're like, man, this is incredible. You've got to try this. And I began to think about this, and I want to ask you this question because I asked myself this question. Am I as good at sharing my faith as I am about sharing recipes? Am I as good at sharing my faith as I am about sharing my favorite restaurant? Am I as good at sharing my faith as I am about sharing a product that has helped me or changed my life? And I think this, I think that if we want to understand what God, what's on God's heart, we must understand that God's, uh, on God's heart is people. And if people are on God's heart, then they must be on our heart too. As Christians, the goal is not to get saved and just go, okay, we're good. We get to come together and worship God together because if that was the case, guess what? As soon as you gave your life to Jesus, you would go to heaven. But that's not the goal. The goal is to be a light in the darkness, to be a city that's set on a hill. Come on, to be salt in the earth like God has called us to make a difference in the earth around us. Luke 19.10, it says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It's exactly what Jesus didn't come to set up another religion. He came to seek and to save the lost. A recent study that I read uh, that kind of birthed this entire message was this, that 53% of people have never and may never go to church. 53% of people have never and may never go to church. And when I read that, I began to think, man, you know, church has changed my life. Like, like church, church has changed my life. Like, like I've been healed in church. I've been restored in church. I've been, I've been, I've, I've heard the word of God that, that has changed my life in church. Like I, I've encountered the presence of God. And sometimes, you know, life happens and you might fall away from church, but, but most of you in this room know exactly where to go. Like, man, I need to get back into church. Like I, I need to be a part of church. You have a place that you will go, but 53% of people do not know where to turn when trouble hits, when crisis hits, when things get hard. They don't know where to turn, and something that we take for granted, they don't even know about. 53% of people out there don't know about what's going on in here. Like hope, we're hope dealers. Like, like God's changing lives. Marriages are being restored. And it, 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 for all you businessmen out there, if I were to tell you this, that, that, that 53% of people in Tampa would never hear about your product. Like they wouldn't know about your product, they wouldn't hear about it, they would never walk through the doors of your store. Most businessmen immediately would, go, would put a team together and go, how can we reach that 53%? Like I'm not taking no for an answer. Like, like how can I get, it's not like, well, I guess that's just the way it is, brother. Like that's not what we do. Like you would immediately go in to action and go, how can I get our product in these people's hand? Because no is not good enough. And I would just say this, that if a businessman would go into action, action to make more money. Come on, we got as a church need to get into action to reach people with the gospel that changes lives. It's too good not to share. The gospel is too good not to share. Now, I honestly believe that whenever you see an empty seat, you should automatically think, God, who can I bring to sit in that seat? Like immediately a prayer should hit our heart because, again, I go back to this, that people are on God's heart, so they should be on our heart. We shouldn't go, oh, yeah, I get to stretch out a little bit more. Like we should immediately go, God, who can I bring? 
Like who in my neighborhood, who in my workplace, who, who, who in my, at, the, at the convenience store or the grocery store, who can I bring? And I'll just tell you this, I will speak on behalf as an overseer of your pastors and say this, I promise you, you will not run out of room. As long as you bring people, they will add services, they'll build bigger buildings, they will do whatever it takes to reach your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people go, well, I just like the way the church is. Like, I like the size that you can fall in love with something that God's not in love with. Because long, as long as one person out there does not know the love of Jesus, the church is not big enough. As long as there's one person out there that needs to hear the hope that you have heard and has changed your life, the church is not big enough. A couple of ways that we share our faith is we share our faith through relationships. Like relationships are the way that, that most people, most people are not going to hear about, uh, n- their lives are not going to be changed by someone preaching on a microphone on a street corner. Their lives aren't going to be changed by a picket sign. Their lives are going to be changed through relationships. Through people that that just love them and care for them. I actually had a, a, a guy, when we were getting ready to launch our church, and his wife, uh, we, him and his wife, we had a meeting at Chick-fil-A. Come on, y'all. Christian chicken. And we're, we're having this uh, meeting, and I'm talking to the, the wife is so excited, like we're planting this church, and man, she, I'm fired up, and, and everybody's fired up at the table, and I look at him, and he's just quiet. And I said, what about you? What are you fired up about? He goes, not me. He goes, I love my wife, and church makes her happy, but I'm an atheist. And I was like, okay. And I think he automatically went into defense mode, like, like, he's, like I, I'm, I'm about to start, like, dropping Bible verses. Like, and I said, oh, okay, that's, that's totally cool. And he goes, can I still come? And I was like, yeah, come on. He's there, and he's, he's, his wife is there, and she's serving on a Sunday, and he walks up to me, and he goes, hey, uh, P- PB, they call me PB. Hey, PB, can, can I, as long as I'm doing something, can I, like, I'm here, can I just help out, like, set stuff up? I'm like, yeah. He starts setting things up, and he's just in church every Sunday. And I told my wife whenever we left that, that meeting at Chick-fil-A, I said, he's going to be one through relationship." And you know what we did? We loved him. We cared for him. We embraced him and his disbelief. Like we just, we, in one day in a service just like this, I was preaching a message and he lifted his hand and gave his life to Jesus. It did not come through a picket sign. It didn't come through me quoting scripture. It came through relationship. In 1 Corinthians 9, 22 through 23, it says, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything that I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in its blessing. You know, the Bible says this, that you will be fishers of men. God called us to be fishers of men. I just got back from a week-long fishing trip in Montana. And, and I love to fish. Anybody else love to fish out there? Come on. If you don't, you need Jesus. Amen? <laughs> I'm surprised there's not more fishermen in the room. But, but, but one thing that I do is I love to fish, and, and I've never met a good fisherman who walks out and casts one time, reels it in, and goes, well, they're not biting. I guess I'm going to go home. Like, never. Because good fishermen know that the fish are there. And so what they do is, is they fish. And they cast into a spot, and they reel in, and they go, okay, that didn't work, but I'm going to try again. And I'm going to try again. And I'm going to try again. And, well, that's not working. Maybe I can try a different approach, or I can try a different lure, or I, I can do something different to get the fish to actually bite so that I can get them in the boat. Like, like I'm going to work. I'm going to work until, and, and, and fishermen never lose hope. Because even as the sun is setting, they keep thinking, one more cast. 
Come on, just one more, because this could be the one. This could be the one that gets it. This could be the one where it happens. Like This could be the one full of hope until it gets dark. Like We're going to keep casting uh, the line until we catch something. And I will just say this. The Bible says that God has called us to be fishers of men, meaning this, that we should be full of hope, that it might not happen on the first invitation. It might not happen on the 50th invitation. It might not happen on the 1,000th invitation. But I'm going to keep casting the line and saying, man, God, I know that one day, one day they may say yes. One day they may come to church with me. One day they may be like that man that was an atheist and lift their hand and accept Jesus as their personal Savior. We have to share our faith through relationship, and it matters how you act. A recent statistic shows that 88% of Christians or 88% of people will become a Christian if they know a loving and caring Christian. But here's the sad thing is the opposite is true. 88% of people will not accept Jesus if they know a mean, hateful Christian. Again, we're called to be salt and light. Salt makes things better. Light makes things brighter. Number two, we share our faith because people need Jesus. These are the reasons why we share our faith. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, I don't know how it is here, but in the South, we have two, two rules in the South that, that we've heard pro- probably all of our life. There's two things that they say that you do not talk about. You do not talk about religion, and you do not talk about politics. Anybody ever heard those two rules? Come on. And I, and I, I actually was uh, thinking about that, and I would say this, that I agree with both. The reason why I agree with both, and you're like, wait, you're saying too good not to share, is because politics will not change your life, and religion will not change your life. So I'm here today telling you, don't share your religion. Share your relationship with Jesus because it's my relationship with Jesus that changed my life. It's my relationship with Jesus that healed me. It was my relationship with Jesus that restored my marriage. It was re- relationship with Jesus that broke addiction in my life. It's a relationship with Jesus. We're not here to push religion. We're here to let people know that you can have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Practical ways that we can do this. Are you ready? I got to go. Number one, four points for you, and I'm done. Number one, pray for the lost. Pray for people. You know, prayer is not like a spare tire, it should be our steering wheel. Like we should pray. Like we should pray. It's like, well, I guess all we can do is pray, brother. (laughs) Like we should pray first. I, I did. Uh, I, I was a youth pastor before I was a, a senior pastor, and I, I did a, a, a internship program. And in this internship program, I, I, I just put out a challenge uh, to these interns, and I said, "Hey, here's the thing." And I called it "Take Five." And and uh, and it was what I challenged them to do was I said, "I want you to think of five people that you know that are far from God." And I want you to write them down in a place where you can see it every single day. And I want you to pray for them. Like, just pray for them. God, I thank you that you're bringing people into their life, that they're going to they're gonna hear a gospel, that their, their lives are going to, like, just pray for them. Just pray for them every single day. We, we did this. I said, I want you to do this for a year. And at the end of a year, we pulled out all of those names, and 90% of those names were in church, actively serving God, in love with the house of God, and serving God. Amen? And so that was amazing. But there was, there, my wife had one name on her list, one name on her list that did not get into church, that did not give their life to Jesus. And she kept praying. She kept praying. I didn't even know that she was doing it. She kept praying. We have two campuses uh, in, in, at our church, and she's, pray, she's, she's still praying for this. And, and, and all of a sudden, this, this young man's name comes up in a conversation. And my wife goes, oh, I've been praying for them. 
And the campus pastor at our other church says, oh, they're in church? They're on our serve team. They're serving God. They're in love. She prayed for that young man for 10 years. Can I tell you that your prayers do not go unheard? It may, take, it may take years or decades, but I'm telling you, you just keep praying. We pray for people that are far from God because we know this, that God is faithful. So I'll ask you this question. What five people can you pray for? What five people can you pray for? Number two, we need to recognize the opportunities God gives you. Recognize the opportunities that God gives you. Proverbs 16, 9 says, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And I'll just say this, that I think as people, we are so distracted that we miss the opportunities that God puts in front of us. We are so distracted by our phones. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, no, he didn't. Sally, get your purse. We're out of here. Like, we're so distracted by the things that are going on that we miss the opportunities. We miss the hurting people standing next to us in line. Because I, it would be awkward for us to just stand there. Like, I made a decision that, that I think that I miss so many opportunities that, that I made a des- decision that when I walk into any store, I put my phone in my pocket, unless it's an emergency, I don't take it out. Because I just want to walk around and I want to say, God, what opportunities do you have for me? Who can I love in this place? Who can I care for? Who, who can I minister to? Like, man, sometimes I go in and nothing happens and that's okay. I think it's just making ourselves available to be used by God. Like, just make yourself available. Don't be so distracted because I don't think that we're ever going to get to heaven and go, man, you know what? I'm glad I spent so much time on Facebook. You will say, man, I'm glad. I'm glad I love people. I'm glad I cared for people. I'm glad I took time and I I wasn't distracted to help people along the way. I say it like this. Keep your heads up and your hearts open. Keep your eyes up and your heart open for what God has for you. Number three, look for common ground, not battleground. Hmm. The Apostle Paul was, the amass- was a master at this. He said in Acts 17, through 23, he says, So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows, Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking around, I saw uh, your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. I love this so much because you you notice this, that Paul's walking around and he's looking for common ground, not battleground. Like, like he's, he's walking around and he's noticing that they're worshiping all these shrines and these, these different idols. Like, he's, he's seeing all this. And he could have picked a fight. Like, you're going to hell, you bunch of sinners. Like, like he could have done that. But he said, listen, I, I found some common ground. And there's a God that, that you say that is the unknown God. And that's the God that I come to proclaim to you today. Like, we have to find out as a church that I've got to be a person that I look for common ground. I, I don't look for battlegrounds. Like, like, I think the church has gotten so good at letting people know that what we're against that they don't even know what we're for anymore. Because we got to find the common ground. I love this principle, and I try to apply it in my life. John Maxwell has a principle called the 101% principle. And he says this, find the 1% that you can agree with someone on and focus 100% of your attention to that one thing. Like just one thing. Like Because everybody can find something that they disagree on with everything. Come on, we live in an offended society. But everybody can find one thing that you agree on, right? Like we can find one, some common ground. And if we would give 100% of our attention, the problem is, is that most people and most Christians do the exact opposite. We find the one thing that we don't agree on and we give 100% of our attention to that. Like we need to be okay to have people that don't vote like us. 
We need to be okay with people that don't believe exactly like us. But guess what? We, we can give attention to this, that we serve a living God. Like, I serve Jesus. Like, we are so passionate about, like, I found this. If you just let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit, he's pretty good at it. Because I can't change you. My wife's been trying to change me for 22 years, and it ain't worked yet. And if she can't do it in 22 years, you're not going to do it in two minutes. Amen? Last thing, and I'm done. Key, keyboard can come because it makes me sound more spiritual. <laughs> you, know the, you know it's good. You're like, man, I can smell lunch when the keyboard comes. Just breathe it in. You know he's done. You know he's done. You know he's done, Sally. You know he's done. He's, he's nearly wrapping it up. Number four. Remember that the lost are on God's heart, so the lost should be on our heart. I've said this many times, but, but it's so important, and I really want to drive this home. In Luke 19, 10, again, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You know, several years ago, I had a little dog named Rosie, and Rosie was a Chawini. For those of you that don't know what a Chawini is, it's a Chihuahua and a weenie dog mix. When I was growing up, we just called those mutts, but now we have fancy names for everything, right? And they charge thousands of dollars. You're like, dude, that's a mutt, man. got a fancy name, so it's worth at least $3,000, yeah. But I had this uh, Chawini, and, and she, she was a little bitty. She weighed four pounds, and so she was tiny, and she was my dog. I don't know why she just attached to me. Like, she was just my dog. Like, I would carry her around. Like, I loved this dog. She didn't like anybody else. She was kind of mean to everybody else. Like, if they got too close to me, she'd go, like, just mean. She loved me, though. One day I came in, and it had been storming, and she didn't like storms, and I came in from work, and I opened the door, and I called her name, and, and normally she always ran to me, like immediately ran to me, and she didn't run to me. I'm like, that's weird. Maybe she's cowered in a corner somewhere, like terrified of the storm. So I go around. I'm calling her name. I'm walking all through the house, and, and there's, there's, there's like nobody, like the, she's not coming, like she's not around, and, and so now I'm kind of starting to get a little bit worried because I love this little dog. And I open the back door, and I call her name, and I realize that someone had left the back gate open. Someone being in this general area over here. Again, she loved me, but she didn't love everybody. And so I'm just saying there's a conspiracy going on here. And so I, 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 I get a little panic, and I start calling her name, and I'm walking through the neighborhood, it's raining. I'm a grown man and I'm calling Rosie. Come on, let's be real. All you pet on Rosie girl. Woo! Like what? I don't know what happened. Come here, girl. Like you're, you start making all kinds of weird. And people are driving by and looking at me, and I don't care. In fact, they would roll their window down, and I would be like, hey, have you seen my dog? A little bitty dog. Like, I love this dog. Her name's Rosie. Like, if you see her, please let me know. I'm giving out my address. Like, this is where I'm at. Like, please help me find. I start sharing it on Facebook. I call my family. I, I let friends know. Like, I'm like, my dog is missing. Uh, and, and randomly, like, I would get, I would get these, like, uh, text messages or, or calls and like, hey, we've spotted Rosie. We called it Rosie Spottings, right? Like she was, a, we were in a small town and, and they would say, hey, I tried to get her. In fact, she was such a weird dog. I'm going to take a little more time. I know I got to end, but I'm sorry. Uh, but she was such a weird dog that, that she was uh, scared of everything. And my best friend went over to check on her, right? Like went over to check on her one day and he goes, hey, there's something wrong with your dog. And I was like, what do you mean? What's wrong with my dog? And he's like, well, uh, she's running around on three legs and she pees every time I try to pick her up. I'm like, no, that's completely normal. No, that's, that's her normal. That's Rosie normal. 
And so every time somebody would try to get her, they would, she would run from them, right? Like, and so they would call me, and I would immediately drop what I was doing, and I would go to the area, and I would drive around with my windows down going, Rosie! Like, Rosie! Like, I, I called out, and, I, and I, I would cry out for over and over and over again. And this went on for weeks. And every night, I would go to bed, and I would be worried about Rosie. And every morning I would wake up and the first thing on my mind was Rosie. Like, like I was like, man, maybe today will be the day that Rosie comes home. And, and, and days go by and, and days turn into weeks. And, and finally it's been three weeks and there's no Rosie. Like the sightings have become less and less. And finally one day I get a phone call. And it's a little old lady and she said, uh, excuse me, sir, I have your dog. And I was like, what? She's way out in the country, like in the middle of nowhere. She's like, yeah, I have your dog. I'm like, just hold on to her. I get in my car, and I drive to her as quickly as I can. I get out of the car, and as soon as I walk around, she's got Rosie in her hand, and Rosie is freaking out, right? Like, like she's so excited, and I pick Rosie up, and I hug this lady, and I said, thank you so much for taking care of my dog, for finding my dog. Like, thank you so much. I jump in the truck, and I drive home, and I walk in, and I'm carrying Rosie, and all the family is there, and I go, Rosie's home! Rosie's home, y'all. Like, my wife has a picture of this. Rosie's home. Like, I'm so excited that my dog, and all the house gets excited and celebrates. And I did that over a dog. And I just, I'm telling you right now that I have a picture of Jesus in heaven. Because the Bible says that when one person comes to Jesus, that all of heaven rejoices. And so I picture Jesus walking around heaven saying, Sally's home, Justin's home, Peter's home, like, like they're home. And all of heaven begins to rejoice. And can I tell you, church, that we get to be a part of the rescue mission. We get to be a part of bringing God's children home to Him. It's too good not to share. Simple invitation. Simple sharing of your faith. Well, I'll take an invitation, but what if they say no? Maybe it opens the door. They go, I didn't know you was a Christian. Yeah, man, Jesus changed my life. I just, I'm always looking for an opportunity to share the gospel that's changed my life. Because I can't go to bed at night knowing that 53% of people don't have the hope that I have. That haven't heard the gospel that's changed my life. I love this poem, and I'll end here. It's a poem about heaven. It says, When you enter the beautiful city, and the saved all around you appear, what joy when someone will tell you, it was you who invited me here. Can I pray with you right where you are? Lord, right now I thank you for every person. Lord, that they're carrying a message of hope. They're carrying a message of life transformation. Their lives have been changed forevermore. And Lord, right now, I just pray right now for every person, Lord, that you're opening doors for us to share our faith. You're opening doors for us to invite people. You're opening doors, Lord, that we will not be distracted, but God, we will be focused on what you're focused on, and that is that people are on your heart, so they're going to be on our heart too. God, that tonight when we go to bed at night, that we're going to be thinking about the 53%. When we wake up in the mornings, we're going to be thinking on the 53%. And as a church, we are determined that that statistic cannot stand. Because as long as one people is, one person is far from you, we're going to be on mission to reach as many people as we can with the gospel that's changed our life. Lord, I thank you even now that you're dropping five people in, in their hearts, Lord, that they're going to begin to pray for them. They're going to begin to share their faith. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one's looking around. Maybe you're in this room and you don't know Jesus. You never ask him into your heart. You never ask him to be the Lord of your life. 
you thought you're here by accident, but the truth is, is Jesus is calling you. He's drawing you. If you're here and you say, Brian, that's me. I don't know Jesus. Maybe you're here in this place and you say, Brian, I prayed that prayer. I've asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life, but I'm not living like it. I've walked away from my relationship with Jesus. Today, I want to rededicate my life to him. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you stand on your feet. I'm not going to make you walk down an aisle. And I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, I want you to be bold enough, wherever you are, just to slip your hand up and you can put it right back down. We're going to pray a prayer. Everyone in this room is going to pray this prayer with you. And I believe this. If you pray this prayer, if you believe it in your heart, your life will never be the same. Say, Brian, that's me. I need Jesus in my life for the first time, one. Brian, today I want to rededicate my life to Jesus, too. Brian, will you pray that prayer with me? Three, wherever you are, you can just slip your hand up, put it right back down. Amen. I see that hand. Amen. God loves you. I see that hand. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Can we pray this prayer together as a church family? Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Take my sin. And by your grace, I take your righteousness. I make you the Lord of my life. I give you all that I am. I hold nothing back. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, the Bible says that when one person, everybody celebrate what God has done. Amen.